long as I'm president of the United States, Iran will never be allowed to have a nuclear weapon. Tensions between China and the United States have been increasing over trade, coronavirus, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and now the South China Sea. It takes a few to make war, but it takes a village and a nation to build peace. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Hi, I'm Rob Malley. And I am Naz Modirzadeh. Welcome to the third episode of Hold Your Fire. Today we're going to be discussing one of the most important issues, certainly in Africa, perhaps uh, around the world, which is what's happening in Ethiopia. And we're privileged to have uh, our own senior analyst for Ethiopia, Will Davison, who is in Addis as we speak and who will have uh, the insights from his current experience, but also the many years he spent on that country. But before we do that, Naz, I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of what has been a pretty heavy week uh, when we think about foreign policy and conflict, whether we look at it from a positive or negative direction. Positive, what's happened in, in Afghanistan, the beginning of peace talks, which we spoke about last week, but they actually began uh, on Saturday. On Tuesday, the signing of the peace agreement between Israel and the UAE, the issue that we discussed two weeks ago. And then another item that really caught my eye uh, for personal reasons, which is the New York Times ran a very long feature story about the potential responsibility of the United States in war crimes committed by the Saudi-led coalition in Yemen. I was in the Obama administration when the decision was first taken to help Saudi Arabia in that war. You're a law professor and uh, who knows a lot about international law. So I'm curious what you made about that story. Uh, maybe we could start there. Yeah, absolutely, Rob. A heavy week indeed. And of course, also the anniversary of 9-11 this past week. I think the story in the Times struck me on a number of fronts. At first, it's not all that often that so many prominent international lawyers are quoted in a major New York Times story. And I was struck by how forceful some of the concerns were that were articulated. The idea that indeed, American officials ought to be concerned about potential individual liability, that they should have personal counsel um, ready to defend them in the event that they were to be brought within legal crosshairs in another country. And I think the suggestion that as the war in Yemen has continued and become more and more brutal for the civilian population there that the capacity for the United States government to argue that it is not aware of grave violations of international law being undertaken by the Saudi coalition there become less and less tenable. That what would activate potential legal liability, which would be knowledge or the idea that you should have knowledge of uh, violations that are taking place is by 2020 much more difficult to deny. And certainly uh, when I teach these topics, it's very rare that you suggest to students that U.S. officials are concerned about this kind of accountability. It's much more common to talk about this in the context of Europe and other countries. So it'll be interesting to see whether we see reactions to this piece, whether we see individual officials and perhaps even former officials coming out to say, yes, we did know about these concerns and we were indeed told that we should be nervous about this or whether it will kind of get lost in the overwhelming news cycle we seem to be in the midst of. And of course, it comes after the question of the ICC and Afghanistan. So there's something uh, of a theme. Of course, I mean, I could simply speak from my own experience uh, in the years when I was in the Obama administration. Clearly, we were very concerned. And that led us to both redouble efforts to try to bring at least a ceasefire, if not a peace settlement, but also efforts to try to curb Saudi behavior. Unsuccessful. And I have to say, of all the things that I worked on in the Obama administration, this is certainly not the one that I'm proudest of. I think we mm. have to look back. And Crisis Group wrote a very long report trying to look at why the Obama administration got into this. And it interviewed yeah. a number of people, co former colleagues of mine, and I would share their view about how we mistakenly got into this, knowing that it likely would end up very poorly. And even as we saw it unfold with the grave uh, human rights violations, trying to curb Saudi behavior, and only in the end, at the very end, uh, withdrawing or withholding some uh, weapons supplies to the Saudis. I think we're going to have to come back to this issue of Yemen more generally, but also the U.S. responsibility. Absolutely. And I think in some ways, I think you're right. There's the connection to the ICC and a connection to something that we talked about last week, this idea of responsibility, that even if there is no real 
chance or threat or opportunity, depending on how you are situated on these issues of actual trials or indictments, the notion that there ought to be responsibility, the notion that the civilians in places like Yemen have a right to expect responsibility on the part of foreign governments that intervene, I think really resonated in that story. And of course, the other aspect of this story that connects to something else you mentioned is the link to the Bahrain and UAE deal. So the story begins by arguing that this is part of the Trump administration's declared intent to use arms sales as a key element of foreign policy, one that is being credited as playing a role in the agreements between UAE and Israel and Bahrain and Israel. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we don't know the full story while they're at, were they secret uh, arrangements. We do know, but there's no secret, that the UAE has wanted to have access to America's F-35s, most sophisticated aircraft that, that it wants to get its hands on. That's been true before. It's, it's true now. And maybe, well, it sounds as a certainty that the administration will push for the UAE to have access to it. The U.S. Congress will have something to say about that. I think, you know, that's one element one could perhaps overstate it. He discussed this with Nathan Thrall uh, a couple of weeks ago. I think for the UAE, the main motivator was this is a good way to please an administration that can be quite vindictive when you don't please them, to also hedge against the possibility that Vice President Biden will be elected. And this is a decision to normalize with Israel, which is popular, including among Democrats, most Democrats in the United States. So it's not a bad move on the UAE's part. The Israeli motivation is pretty clear. The U.S. motivation is pretty clear. The story that is missing from all this are the Palestinians. It's a peace between an Arab country and Israel, from which the Palestinians are not just absent physically, they were not on the White House lawn, but they also are not mentioned in any way, significant way, in any of the dealings between the two. The traditional mention and the nod to the Palestinians, but it is clear that this deal has very little to do with their future. And uh, as I argued with Nathan, I think, In some ways, one hopes that this will push the Palestinians uh, even more than they already are not to rely on anyone outside, certainly not on the U.S. I think they learned that lesson and not on the Arab world, which may every now and then give them the nod who are not at this point, either in a position or in any political mood to give them a, a significant help. Yeah, it made me think of something Nathan said about the idea that it was somewhat ridiculous to even think about the idea that these agreements would benefit the Palestinians, that that really we were sort of beyond that point. And I think you're right. There wasn't even that effort to suggest that the Palestinians had been involved in any significant way. One reflection to me is I try all the time to move away from the Middle East because that's what I've been absorbed in for the better part of two decades. but it's almost impossible to escape because the news from the Middle East seems to overcrowd almost everything else, except some places in Africa, and that that will be the topic of today's main discussion. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Today, we are talking with Will Davison. Hi, Will. Hi, Rob. Thanks so much for joining us. I know you're an artist. I know it's raining, and so we might hear the sound in the background, but uh, we will live with that. I want to start with uh, sort of an anecdote. When you and I were, well, you've been there much longer, but I visited Addis with you about a year ago, I think it was. And I was struck in two back-to-back conversations we had. One was with a government official, and the mood there was of Ethiopia with this new prime minister, relatively new prime minister, Prime Minister Abiy recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize, and the notion of a country that could really be on the cusp of a transition towards a more economically prosperous and democratic future. And then a meeting with one of the, I want to call him an opposition leader, one of the most outspoken of them, who said to us, beware Ethiopia could be on the cusp, not of a great future, but of Yugoslavia, a breakup a la Yugoslavia. And I was really struck by those back-to-back conversations Could you explain to our listeners how a country can be at that kind of a crossroads? What is it about Ethiopia that presents the opportunity and the risk? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think this is getting right to the heart of the political problem here. You know, there's a very serious polarization like we have in other places, but it's, you know, particularly acute in Ethiopia. And I think that's sort of very contrasting perspectives are partly explained by the fact that Ethiopia, although it's in many ways a powerful country, it's a very, very fragile country. 
it's still not got itself out of poverty. Um, it's got a huge demographic challenge on its hands, huge climatic challenges, and that's on top of the politics. Now, obviously, when Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed came to power in 2018, there was a lot of euphoria, a lot of hope. A lot of people believed that that change could take the country onto a new democratic path. And I think that explains the positive side of the picture there. And that's, you know, coming out of a period when, you know, pretty dictatorial ruling coalition held sway for over three decades. So that explains the hope. But with, there was also quite a dramatic change in system and has continued to be so since 2018. It has opened up some very deep fault lines. It's exposed some deep fault lines in the country, which they run along ethnicity as well as ideology. They relate to the constitutional system of ethnic federalism themselves. And so that explains the fragility that we got from our other actor. Maybe could you just give us a few words about this ethnic federal system quite, I don't know if it's unique, but quite special to Ethiopia. What does it mean? How does it work? And why after years, maybe because of the dictatorial autocratic regime that preceded this one, things seem to be more or less in check. And now discontent is bubbling up along ethnic lines, but maybe that's overly simplistic. So could you just dig a little more deeply into that aspect of things? Yeah, and it, it's deep indeed. I mean, you know, Ethiopia, as I'm sure you and the listeners know, is very much a, an ancient civilization. It's also a very old African state. Over the last few centuries, although there was plenty of complexity to it, the state building project or the nation building project was kind of strongly dominated by people from the north of the country, Orthodox Christians, predominantly people speaking the Amharic language. That's not the whole story, but that was the predominant characteristic of the state building project. And that was to some extent a homogenizing project. Now, beginning in the 60s, building up into a revolution in, in the 70s, there was an overthrow of that imperial system. And it was then that ethnic identity politics or, you know, sort of subnational identity politics or national identity politics, as the groups would see it, that's when those ideologies became very, very prominent on the Ethiopian political scene. They formed into liberation fronts, into rebel groups. And then eventually there was essentially another revolution in 1991 when a military dictatorship was overthrown. It was subsequent to that, after these ethnic groups had not only found their voice, but also found their, the ability to project political power, that there was a settlement and the settlement that was arrived at was a very drastic departure from the previous sort of unitary arrangements, the creation of a federal structure and a federal structure where the administrative units were essentially demarcated according to ethno-linguistic classifications. So that's where it came from. And then that was, I don't want to get too much into the weeds here, but then that was presided over by a you know, somewhat sort of Soviet or, or Yugoslav style ruling coalition. So the sort of de facto one party state, but with ruling parties forming that coalition, which ran their own regions. And those are the regions which are defined by their ethno-linguistic characteristics primarily. Well, thanks. I think that helps to give us a, a picture of the context and the background. I'm wondering, can you tell us a little bit about what you see as the root of the recent tensions? And in what ways do you see this as potentially undermining or seriously threatening the transition that President Abiy has been overseeing? Excuse me, Prime Minister. Sure. Thanks, Naz. Yes, there have been recent tensions. There have also been tensions in terms of sort of popular civil unrest and responses from the authorities. That's been there since 2014, 2015, led to this change, which was generally seen as very progressive in 2018. And then the problems have continued throughout the transition. Of course, there's no easy answer to this, but there was quite a lot of unity amongst sort of opposition political actors and sort of reformists from the ruling establishment during the period of protests that led to the Prime Minister coming to power. There was quite a lot of unity that the authoritarian system had to be removed. And there was very much a perception of minority rule by the Tigrayan ethnic group and their ruling party, which is known as the TPLF. Now, once those objectives were achieved in 2018, that's when the fissures really started to appear. So some of the people who were lined up against the authoritarian system and the TPLF, they wanted to get rid of the entire ethnic federal structure. They saw it as divisive, as making Ethiopians growing apart. Let's say most significantly, protesters from the Oromo community in Oromia region, Ethiopia's most populous, with 40 million people there or thereabouts, 
they fiercely protect the political movements from Oromia. They fiercely protect Oromia's autonomy. Therefore, they are fierce defenders of the ethnic federal system. So whilst everyone kind of teamed up for the change, after the change occurred, there was no consensus whatsoever on the country's political future. And that has led to all sorts of instability and clashes. And it's sort of accompanied by maybe more sort of generic transitional fragility. You, know, you remove the ruling party. Um, there's a lot of uh, change in the security structures. People are trying to do legislative changes and all the rest of it. So you don't have a particularly stable state and government. And then you have all this very, very fractious politics, violent politics playing out on top of that. Thanks. Well, just one follow up. In a lot of the coverage, I'm reading what also seems like a kind of typical script of talking about transitional moments and countries where there seems to be a suggestion that the leader in whom we repose so much hope and who promises democracy, the minute they are challenged, reverts to many of the tools of oppression and human rights abuse that were associated with the previous government. Is that accurate? I mean, is that the sense within the country that the arrests and the number of prominent human rights activists and others being taken into detention is a return to previous style of government? Well, I'm not going to sit on the fence here, but you know, just to start off saying, obviously, <laughs> you know, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed's political opponents, those who are very, very focused on state repression and human rights abuses. Obviously, they're highly critical of the prime minister at the moment. And then there's his supporters as well. And then when it comes to a sort of a less involved perspective, I think it's also possible to see things where the prime minister has done things well, and also where he's made mistakes. So you know, to try and kind of summarize that, ultimately, this idea of a rapid transition to multi-party democracy, let alone liberal democracy, was somewhat fanciful in Ethiopia. Uh, there wasn't really any of the conditions in place for that. I don't think we need to go into all of those. And then there was this very divisive political scene, you know, absolutely fundamental schisms in the country. It was always going to be very, very hard for the prime minister to please everyone. He has, to his credit, tried to govern from the centre. He has not governed as an ethnocentric Oromo leader, for example, and that is his constituency. But, you know, this ultimately meant that he was never going to be able to keep everybody happy. And so that's part of the dynamic that we are seeing here. But I would also point out that there is a strong characteristic to this transition of the prime minister having a very, very prominent role in it. He has transformed that ruling coalition of regional parties I mentioned. He has transformed that into a single national party called Prosperity Party. And he is the absolutely all-powerful leader of this. And I think you know, personally, and it's legitimate to say that there has also been a sort of over-consolidation of power around the prime minister. And also that plays out in the federal system itself, because that also means there has been an attempt for the federal government to reassert over control of the regions. But, you know, without getting into the back and forth, of course, lots of people thought that the regions did have too much power. They had too much autonomy, and that was risking the integrity of the state. So you could see it from both sides, a very, very difficult political situation that he inherited, but one that hasn't been handled, far from being handled perfectly by the prime minister and his allies. Hold your fire. A podcast by the International Crisis Group. So, okay, taking that and given that we don't want to be overly alarmist, but we also want people to be aware of what is at stake. Could you describe to us what is a sort of a bad case scenario? It doesn't have to be the worst case scenario, but how do things unfold from where we are now to a place that you would consider extremely dangerous, violent for Ethiopia, but maybe also for the broader region? What's the pathway that you currently or the scenario that you fear? Yeah, I mean, there's actually a bunch of, of elements which are, you know, fairly not too kind of fanciful, really. For example, you know, the situation with Tigray region. And I mentioned Tigray in the context of being a this sort of predominant political party in the, in the form of ruling coalition. Its leaders have very acrimonious relations with the prime minister and his allies in the prosperity party. And the federal government and Tigray region, they clashed very seriously over a decision to delay national elections due to the pandemic. The response of Tigray's government was to autonomously run an election for Tigray's regional state council. Now, that has been ruled as unconstitutional, unlawful, null and void 
by the relevant federal institutions. So now we have a regional government in Ethiopia, which is classified as illegitimate by the federal government. Thankfully, so far, we have not seen any really dramatic action. But in fact, the stance that the federal government has taken does pave the way for federal intervention in Tigray region. And almost all of the commentary I've seen on that sets that up as a very worrying situation because Tigray has quite a relatively powerful security force. So you can see these absolutely fundamental critical strains on the federation here. And as you well know, these are the types of things that can lead to civil war. And there is plenty of potential for very serious conflict there. To line up another major element, which is of concern, serious concern, is that the prime minister and the ruling party have lost a huge amount of support, popular support in Oromia region. Some of those tensions that I mentioned earlier, these sort of transitional tensions and the violence, they've led to very serious intercommunal violence, attacks on minorities in Oromia region. Subsequent to the July violence, there was a roundup of thousands of people alleged to be complicit in that unrest, but also a lot of the Oromo nationalist leadership. So this really brings into question whether Oromia is going to participate in the elections in a serious way next year, or whether we're going to see a continuation of the protests that characterized Ethiopian politics from 2015 to 2018. And we have now seen enough signs to know how the federal government will respond to that sort of challenge. So we could therefore be entering a new cycle of violence in that other major sphere of uh, political tension um, in Oromia. So, you know, at Crisis Group, we're in the business not just of analyzing, as you just did, very, very deftly, the various components of the conflict or the ingredients of conflict in Ethiopia. We're also in the business of coming up with practical recommendations. Given where we are, what do you think Ethiopians should do, the leadership, but others, uh, ethnic leadership as well, ethnic elites, and what should foreign countries do if they want to prevent this from escalating? What are some of the ideas that you would recommend? Well, if we just if we just sort of look at what the current trends are and then sort of comment and respond to them, I think the best way to characterize what's happening now is that the prime minister, the federal government and the ruling party are trying to assert political control. They're trying to restore a semblance of security, sort of law and order, which will give them space to run an election next year. Obviously, they would hope to win that election and then they would move ahead with this program of institutional um, and economic reforms that we haven't really spoken about yet. The problem is that the politics looks so turbulent in terms of those uh, issues I've described, but also many others. And there's a lot of political further in in southern Ethiopia where ethnic administrative areas are demanding their own regional states, for example. The problem is that the politics looks so turbulent that the federal government is not really going to get that space that it wants to carry out this program of reforms. And almost inevitably, it's going to have to use some pretty heavy handed tactics to keep trying to control the political space. That does not look like the way forward for Ethiopia. And instead, although obviously, you know, it's very easy to make these suggestions from the types of position that I am in, but it really does look like time to open up Ethiopia's political space in the sense of having a very, very inclusive and comprehensive process that specifically tackles the fundamental divisions that are at the root of Ethiopia's political problems. That's not to say they would sort out all the socioeconomic or the climatic problems, of course, but we really need to address those fundamental political problems. Now, whether that's through a national dialogue, whether that's series, through a series of peace building measures, taking things issue by issue, um, of course, there can be discussions about that. But instead of the kind of trajectory, which I think the country is on, which I sketched out at the beginning of this answer, I think really it's time for people to talk. Let me just, uh, obviously, I'm, I'll put you on the spot here a bit. It's good for people to talk, but only if you think there's a realistic compromise that can be found among the ethnic groups, but also between the ethno-federalists and those who believe that is the wrong model for Ethiopia and who have a more national vision of the country. If you don't think that there's a realistic compromise and it's not clear what dialogue will achieve, based on your conversations, which I'm sure you have, as I said, you're an artist now, I'm sure you're talking to people and you may want to reflect a bit on those conversations. Based on those conversations, on your experience traveling around the country, do you see the makings of a compromise, a national compromise that would satisfy enough people enough to avoid the dire scenario you presented uh, earlier? 
Well, you've put me on the spot, and I think that's going to force me to <laughs> that's, kind of that's, that's get ahead of crisis group on policies. <laughs> but I'm going to put all the blame for that on you. <laughs> I mean, look, clearly there's no sort of uh, low-hanging compromise to be plucked here. And I think we should be absolutely clear about that. There was actually a quite interesting survey recently that showed the country quite split on these sort of ethno-federalist versus non-ethno-federalist positions. But look, I think the way to think about this, and this is very much something which I found talking to people in Oromia, talking to people in southern Ethiopia, talking to people in Tigray over the years, as well as conversations in Addis, of course, which is that not only do we have the reality of the creation of autonomous regions and the sort of boosting of these ethno-linguistic identities, let's say, that is a reality. And it's also something which you're quite significant parts of the population, definitely significant parts of the political classes are quite attached to. So whilst from an objective sense, we might say, you know, Ethiopians need to come together and they need to have a common language. Um, There's uh, too much power on paper to the regions, which have their own security forces, their own constitutions and their own legislatures. We might see that on paper, but actually, you know, dramatically moving away from that system could create the type of disintegration that we all fear the most. Therefore, I think what needs to happen is through this process of dialogue and compromise is a move towards trying to soften the edges of the ethnic federal system. And there are various ways that you could do that. So for example, if better protection from minority rights were built in, in terms of, you know, not being evicted, or being able to educate their children in the languages they want to, if those were brought in a legal sense, then if we had a better functioning democratic federal system, then that would also allow people to exercise those rights as well. And the point here is that you can improve the system in a gradual way. You can take steps against some of the harder edges of this ethnic federal system. For example, there is a secession clause in the constitution. It is legal um, for states to secede from Ethiopia. Um, There is also untrammeled self-determination for any ethnic group of any size. You know, there are there are legal steps that could be taken that would satisfy those who are concerned about Ethiopians and Ethiopian ethnic groups growing apart from each other. But you could do it in a way which does not totally undermine the ethno regional autonomy, um, because if you did that, that could lead to very, very serious blowback from those ethno nationalist groups. So, yes, it's very easy to talk about compromise. Yes, there are indeed very, very fundamental divisions. That's why I think it's necessary to move forward in a generally progressive way. And I think everyone in theory agrees about democratic enhancement. And then you need to have conversations about how to improve the constitutional system and the federal system in a way where, yes, people make some sacrifices, but they're not sacrificing things which they hold so dearly that it could lead to you know, very grave conflict. Well, just following up on the last thing you said, I'm wondering, is it your sense that there is a, for lack of a better word, constituency for the current constitutional system and the ethno-federalist model within the country? That is, is there a significant part of the population that sees itself as wanting to defend the current constitutional system and the ethno-federalist structure? Well, you know, of course, like one of the problems with a situation like Ethiopia's is that you know, we don't have like amazing opinion polling, for example. The media is not strong. Civil society is not strong. You know, people are probably quite still quite fearful of expressing their opinions. It's not that easy to tell. Now, there was this Afrobarometer survey recently, and that was quite significant because there haven't been many like that. That did show a country kind of split along those lines. But then if we think of politics in a more cynical fashion as something of an elite game, well, we clearly have a massive problem. You know, I've spoken about the Tigrayan elites. They appear to be willing to threaten secession, essentially, and to essentially you know, push the, the federal government as hard as possible as they protect you know, what they see as a you know, constitutional system, which is non-negotiable. There is also a very, very significant Oromo nationalist political movement in Oromia and among the Oromo people. And it really was that Oromo nationalist movement, a very, very youthful movement 
which helped bring the change in 2018. So I'm not in a great position to very accurately describe uh, the state of you know, 110 million Ethiopians' views on these things. But I think we can at least see that there is you know, some very serious political support for that kind of regional autonomy and that federal system that you refer to, but also quite a bit of popular support. So first of all, really thanks for uh, all your work. It's great to have you here. It's great to have a crisis group. I don't know if you want to comment on what I'm going to say now, because it's a broader reflection. You and I have discussed this in the past. And it has to do with our model, the crisis group model, and what you just said about elites is very uh, suggestive of that. One of our readers at the time, as you recall, one of the reports that you wrote said, you know, the problem with your model is because you want to prevent or resolve conflict, you always try to placate those who have the ability to provoke conflict, the people who are, in this case, maybe the more radical ethnic uh, forces. And therefore, either you give an incentive to people to pick up arms because that's the only ones, those are the ones whose grievances you're going to take seriously, or you ignore the views, the, the preferences of the quote-unquote silent majority, those who are not prepared to take up arms, but who may feel very strongly about the future of their country. It's something I think that goes beyond Ethiopia. It's something it really made me think about maybe a flaw in our own model. If we are so focused on there not being violence, it means that we are giving, in a way, veto power and disproportionate power to those who have the ability to provoke that violence. I don't know if that inspires any thoughts uh, from either you, Naz, or you, Will, well, because we uh, it's something I think we're going to have to come back to as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, a, you know, it's obviously a very valid question. It does seem like a very hard thing to get around. If it you know, feels like you're sort of pushing at the you know, sort of fundamental questions of how idealistic should we be in these circumstances, or do we just kind of deal with reality? And, and reality deals quite possibly means dealing with sort of powerful and ultimately irresponsible actors, but actors who hold that power. I do feel like in the Ethiopian circumstance, yes, you know, the political elites and these sort of rabble rousers that you mentioned, they do have a lot to answer for. But I think I come down fairly strongly on the side of saying that whilst they have the potential to tear the country apart, and arguably they're already doing so, if we're going to start putting the country back together, it is uh, integral to that is working with them and hopefully, you know, then working with each other and gradually starting to act in a more constructive fashion. Thanks very much, Will. I think a lot for our readers to think about and uh, a lot of really useful information and context for how we think about what's in the headlines uh, these days on Ethiopia. So thank you so much for joining us. It, it really was a pleasure. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Uh, Rob, before we close, I wanted to ask you, what should we be reading on crisisgroup.org this week? The one piece, it's a, actually a commentary that I'd recommend for people because it didn't really make the news, is that you're seeing a lot of unrest in Colombia. It started in a way, Colombia had its own quote-unquote George Floyd moment with a, an incident of police brutality that exacerbated some of the protests. But there's a lot else going on uh, in terms of a uptick in violence, some of it related to the effects of the pandemic, some of it related just to the inequalities uh, that Colombia is facing. So a, a really insightful commentary. And then uh, another one of our podcasts. We have this podcast. We have another podcast that's called War and Peace that's uh, focused on, on Europe. And this week they looked at uh, how Brexit may sour European security cooperation. So I'd encourage our listeners to go listen to that as well in their free time. Absolutely. And I'll just second the recommendation to read the Columbia briefing. It's a pretty short read. And I think a reminder of the level of violence that threatens people in many parts of that country that has been going on even during the pretty severe lockdown, Corona related lockdown in Colombia. Well, Rob, that's it for this week. Thank you for listening to Hold Your Fire. If you have any questions, please send them to media at crisisgroup.org and we'll be very happy to answer them. Have a good week, everyone. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group.